So could you tell us a bit more about why you are pursuing a net zero goal? Uh, what are the benefits and why is this important to you? I think it, it's super central from a very basic perspective and that's for a utility to, to stay competitive. Uh, our strong belief is that moving ahead of the curve is the best way to, to create a competitive advantage and, and, and uh, mm -hmm. the opposite, to, to, to wait with and, and hope that be a laggard um, mm -hmm. is, is, is a survivable strategy we think is super, super dangerous. So it's to stay competitive. What positive action is your company taking already that is driving the change needed to make net zero a reality? We've taken a lot of initiatives uh, in, in, in this direction over the years. Uh, and, and just recently we uh, were take, took part in the auction, uh, coal uh, auction in, in Germany. So we have closed our coal plant Norberg uh, quite mm -hmm. recently. But there are many, 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 many parts of it. So, th so that's reducing emissions. We also invest in very heavily in wind. We are very active in, in e-mobility. So, both on the reducing mm -hmm. and building the renewable side, we we have many. We we invest essentially all our growth capital into into renewables. Obviously, we've just talked a bit about the benefits of pursuing a net zero goal, but when it comes to the challenges, what do you see as the most significant hurdle when it comes to companies achieving net zero? How have you been able to overcome this? I think it's it's a lot about being convinced that it's economically feasible. For The, the reality for many companies is that to dare to do it, uh, because you can be convinced as an individual that this is the way mm. we have to go. Uh, but at the same time, your company needs to, to to be economically viable this year, the year after, and the year after. And when you look at some of the changes that you need to make, you might it might be actually difficult to combine these two perspectives. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that takes quite a lot of a, a mindset shift to dare to take that. Um, shift and partnering is so important because policies help to reduce the risk and partnering also can help you to reduce the risk and then increase your abilities to uh, and potential to succeed. What do you know now that you wish you'd known before when you started strategizing and planning for a net zero future? I think the most important insight, I would say, is that it was right to go uh, in the direction we went. And, and uh, so if anything, we would like to have dared even more even earlier. Uh, mm. it, it is, but it, I mean, it's, it's really hindsight. Uh, but, but I think that's the insight, uh, I would say, that uh, there are so many things that is happening faster than, than you expect. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can be kind of mentally believing in that, but actually taking the real step, making the economic mm -hmm. consequence, taking the economic consequences just takes some more convincing before you do it. Uh, and, and I think that's on the one hand sound because we have to be concerned about the, the, the economic viability of, of the companies mm -hmm. we work for but but if anything taking the steps all steps a bit earlier and maybe even mm -hmm. a bit more forceful would, would, would be would be the right answer And bearing all of this in mind, I mean, what is the main learning you would share with a company at the beginning of their net zero journey? First of all, uh, do it, make the commitment, mm -hmm. um, because it, it does change your perspective. It, it goes, it goes in, in many situations, it goes from if we need to do something to how we are going to do it. 
And I think that's uh, that's probably that's much better focus of resources and, and thinking and process is to to go from if to how. Um, but, but, and, and as soon as you've done that mental shift, I think you're on your way of, of, of creating a lot of value. Actually, I know I've heard you talk a few times about the value of backcasting versus forecasting. Perhaps you could talk a bit about that, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's a it's a good um, it's a good concept and uh, to to discuss these matters around and 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 by forecasting, uh, what we mean by that is that you 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 think about the future and you and, and you decide on your action based on the current realities. And, mm -hmm. and for most companies, the current realities is that you have a business plan for this year, you have a business plan for next year, and even some years beyond that. You have a lot of requirements from, on that, and, and you, you can only act based on the policies that are out there today mm -hmm. or the ones that you have a high probability of, of seeing that it will come. Yeah. And then you come to a certain trajectory. Uh, backcasting is to say we need to be in a certain place uh, by a certain year. For example, that we need to be net zero by 2040, and then you think mm -hmm. about what you need what you need to do. And in, in in this context, you end up in very different trajectories if you do the forecasting, mm -hmm. sitting stuck in yeah. current realities, versus if you think about where you need to be and then backcast. And, and I think that's. Uh, that's what more and more companies, and, and that would, I would, would be the shift that I just talked about, that if you go to say, uh, we are going to commit to 20, 20 net zero by, by 2040, or whatever year you feel is relevant, then you force yourself into the backcasting. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm very, very convinced that companies that don't get into backcasting mode and backcasting activity planning, are uh, in a danger zone. So on the concept of how you're working with others to deliver on this, I'd be interested to hear a bit more about how you are engaging with your supply chain and across sectors more broadly to drive the net zero transition across the economy and achieve the systemic change that we are talking about here? I think, of course, it's important to look at the, the full value chain. And uh, uh, we work with our suppliers uh, to, to build all the wind power that is needed to fuel or, or, or that needed for the transition. You need a lot of steel. And, and of course, steel is, as we know, one of the more emitting industries there are. And, and so on the one hand, we have hybrid that is on the way to solving the problem in the long run. But of course, there are lots of other things that needs to be done as well until there is enough steel with the, with the hybrid uh, technology or similar. Uh, so we, we need to work very actively with the suppliers. We do. We, we put common goals for reduction. Uh, so that's the upstream. If we downs, and then of course we, I mean our own operations is pretty clear what we need to do. And then downstream, for example, we sell a lot of gas uh, to uh, and electricity, but gas to our customers, and and mm -hmm. that's something we need to work very actively and we put together a plan because now when we have the commitment, we need to solve that downstream issue as well. Mm -hmm. and, and so we work very actively with our customers. And, and, and find solutions for them to convert from gas to other solutions. When it comes to COP26, what is the most important outcome you are hoping for from COP26? I think is to to solidify the backcasting perspective, perspective uh, generally, that and 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 I think that many many countries and I think mo most stakeholders, important stakeholders, they actually have an end goal. Uh, I mean that large, all the mm -hmm. large economies in the world actually have, but I don't think necessarily that they've started the mathematical exercise of, of doing if you want to fit for, there is no fit for 55 in china there is no fit for 55 
in the US to the same extent that there is in Europe, where you actually taken the commitment, translating it to where do we where do, where do we need to be in the middle station, where I think 2030 is an excellent because it's it gives us some time, but it still doesn't require us to do all the things in the last years. So, so I think that the I actually quite impressed by, with Europe to get to the fit for 55. And we all know that there is a lot of things that still is not kind of ironed out exactly how it will look. But we we have come to the realization that we need to have a fit for 55. So, so okay. I, I, if 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 the world could agree that. We all, everyone needs a fit for 55. Uh, I think would be a great, uh, a great achievement.